What is up you guys? In this one, I'll show you everything you need to know about CUDA programming so that you could make use of GPU parallelization through simple modifications if you're already existing code running on a boring CPU. The following video was recorded on NVIDIA's Jetson Orin supercomputer in Abu Dhabi, the UAE, and under a Creative Commons license. I'm Ahmed Bezi signing in on this one. I'm using a Sublime text as an editor here. I love experimenting with different code editors. First, I'll start by writing a simple function that does a vector multiplication, which will first run on a CPU. Therefore, my Python code contains nothing fancy and is very classical. I will start by importing the NumPy package, then I will create a function called multiply my vectors that takes three vectors in where A and B are treated as inputs and C would be our storage array given as input so its values will be affected. Next, I will create a main function that initializes three vectors A, B and C of type float32 and of sizes 64 million each, which is enormous. Before calling my multiply my vectors on the three vectors, I will start a timer. Then after executing multiply my vectors on a CPU, I will compute the amount of time taken to multiply two vectors each of size 64 million and of type float32. Then to show that multiply my vectors executes properly, I will print the first and last six elements of C to ensure we're getting the right values and then print out how long it took. So let's go ahead and run this pure Python version, which will be executed on a CPU. Oops, there seems to be an error in this code since I did not import the timer package. So from time IT, I will import default underscore timer as timer. Also, another error is that I'm using the old X range, which now should be range. Running this all seems to work well, and as you can see, this is taking a lot of time. This is natural as we are multiplying 64 million flow32 numbers on a CPU. You can see we get all ones as expected in about 31.4 seconds. Again, this is a lot of time for many online applications. Now one possible acceleration technique I'm going to show in this video is to simply tell the Numba compiler I have a function that I want it to parallelize for me and then automatically compiles and move that function to the GPU. We will be doing this using Numba Pro vectorize capability and applying it to our multiply my vectors function. The first trick using vectorized parallelization is that the multiply my vectors function must be a scalar function. This means that all input and output parameters must be scalar values recognized by NumPy, such as float32, float64, and so on. Currently, our multiply my vectors function is set up to receive all three arrays as input parameters and not return any values. The vectorized decorator expects the multiply my vectors function to accept some number of scalar inputs and return a single scalar output. So our first step is to take our current multiply my vectors function and cast it into a scalar function. To do that, we return the result of scalar a times b and we no longer need to pass in c. Now the number compiler can apply the scalar function automatically across our NumPy arrays on the GPU. Then our last step is to tweak 
the call of the function multiply my vectors and change how the multiply my vectors function is called. We are now returning C instead of passing it into the parameters. Now, to use the vectorized library, we first need to import it from number pro as such and import vectorize from it. One last thing I need to do is declare a Python function decorator, which goes on the line immediately above our function and begins with the at symbol. The first input parameter to this decorator is a list of strings containing the signature of the function that is to be accelerated. Think of this as the blueprints of the C functions. Now this function will be compiled to the GPU machine code, therefore the compiler needs to know the data types to expect for both input and output parameters. Our multiply my vectors function is called with float32. So let's create that signature. The first entry is the output data type expected from the function and then the remaining are the types for the input parameters. So for A, we have float32 and for B, we also have float32. By default, the vectorized function will create a compiled single-threaded CPU version of a function. But that's not any fun, so we're going to create a massively parallelized GPU version. So I'll set the target equal to GPU. Note that some of you may have to set this to CUDA, and that's all there is to it now. Running this, we get this error because I have not installed the number package. So let's hop on over our terminal and run pip3 install number. This might take some time depending on your internet speed. So now let's change number pro to number and change the target to CUDA instead of GPU as I already mentioned. As expected, running this massive multiplication on a GPU takes about 0.64 seconds as opposed to 31.4 seconds when running on a CPU. This gain translates to at times 50 in terms of speed thanks to the parallelization on such a huge number of cores. Amazing! This simply means that running a complex program on a CPU taking about a month could be simply executed in 14 hours on a GPU. This could be also done faster if you were given more cores. Keep in mind that GPUs have more cores than CPUs. And hence, when it comes to parallel computing of data, GPUs perform exceptionally better than CPUs even though GPUs have lower clock speed and lack several core management features as compared to CPUs. Now, I'll use VS Code as my editor. So I'll hop on over terminal and run code as such. Here's me running the previous multiplyvectors.py script, which ran on 0.32 seconds. Let's create another script called fillarray.py, where the main purpose is to show the gains from GPU when simply filling arrays. I'll start by importing NumPy and the timer package to compute the time taken to execute functions. First, let's create a function called fill array without GPU, which will run on a pure CPU. Now, what the fill array without GPU function simply does is takes an array in and fills up 10 million entries of this array, following the simple incremental equation. Remember that this function will run only on a CPU. Next, Let's create a similar function that is not similar at all. Meaning that this function is called fill array with GPU, 
which will get the same job done, but this time on a GPU. The content of fill array with GPU is exactly the same as that of fill array without GPU. However, as we did in the multiply vectors.py example, we will first import this time CUDA and JIT. JIT, or just in time compilation, is a compiler feature that allows a language to be interpreted and compiled during runtime rather than at execution. Using JIT, I will declare a decorator by specifying the target backend to CUDA. Before implementing the body of fillarray.py, I will run fillarray to make sure we have no errors. Perfect, all is set. Now in the main, let's initialize an all ones array called A of size 10 million, where each entry is a float 64. Let's start the timer, then call the first function, that is fill array without GPU, then print the amount of time it took to execute fill array without GPU, which is running only on a simple boring <laughs> CPU. Similarly, let's start a timer, then call the second function, that is fill array with GPU, then print the amount of time it took to execute fill array with GPU, which is running on a GPU. Let's run the fill array.py script, and as we can see, the amount of time it took to fill the array on a CPU is about 2.58 seconds, as opposed to 0 0.39 seconds on a GPU, which is a gain of about 6.6. .6. Again, a massive gain. The following code will demonstrate why you see some film producers or movie makers <laughs> rendering and editing their content on a GPU. GPU rendering delivers with a graphics card rather than a CPU, which may substantially speed up the rendering process because GPUs are primarily built for fast picture rendering. GPUs were developed in response to graphically intensive applications as opposed to the slow processing speed of CPUs. I will create a Mandelbrot. For those into mathematics, the Mandelbrot set is the set of complex numbers for which the function f of z equals to z squared plus c does not diverge to infinity starting from z equal to zero. Intuitively speaking, it's all numbers, including complex ones, that you keep squaring over and over again and do not blow up. So for example, if I take z equal 2, that does not work since if I keep squaring it, it explodes up to infinity. In contrast to z equal 1, which remains 1, and in contrast to z equal half, which shrinks down to zero. Now on real numbers, we do not have a surface to visualize, but things get really interesting when working with complex numbers. Since we can visualize them on the IQ or real and imaginary plane, and we can see the beautiful fractal curves on the boundaries of the Mandelbrot set. Anyways, back to GPUs. I'll create a script called Mandelbrot on CPU, which will simply plot the Mandelbrot set rendered on a CPU, and we'll see how much time it will take. We will start off by importing NumPy as MP, matplotlib to visualize the Mandelbrot, and the timer to compute the time taken to render. I'll create a Mandelbrot function that takes in the XY values of the complex number Z, namely the real and imaginary parts of Z, as well as the maximum number of iterations we are willing to iterate. We keep iterating over Z equal to Z squared plus C. So the rule here is that a point belongs to the Mandelbrot set if and only if its magnitude square is below 4, or equivalently if its magnitude is less than 2. Now this function called create underscore fractal will render our Mandelbrot image. Simply, all this function does is that it sets the colors per pixel. The input image 
will be modified during the execution of the function and its pixels will be adjusted according to its width and height. We first read the width and height according to the dimensions of the image. Then we compute the sizes of the pixels along the X and Y axis. Next, we create a 2D loop so that we can walk over all the pixels in our XY plane. Each pixel X value specifies the real part and the Y value specifies the imaginary part of the complex value to be evaluated by the Mandelbrot function. The output of the Mandelbrot specifies the color of that pixel. After we are done from the create underscore fractal function, we initialize a blank image of size 5000 by 7500. Now that images are uint 8s or unsigned integers of 8 bits. Before calling the create underscore fractal function, do not forget to wrap it around with timers so that we can evaluate the time taken to execute the create underscore fractal function so to render the image. After execution, we print the amount of time it took to execute that function. Then finally, we plot the image using the mshow function of matplotlib. Now here, we're going to wait a bit since we're running or we're rendering the image on a CPU. Here's the Mandelbrot set and as we can see, this took a lot of time on a CPU. About 110 seconds, that's around 2 minutes for a Mandelbrot that does not seem to be so simple on a CPU. Now, I'll be creating another script called Mandelbrot on GPU, which could be seen as a sister script of Mandelbrot on CPU. However, we're going to run this on a GPU. I will copy the same packages and the Mandelbrot function since those remain unaffected. As we did in the fillarray.py script, I will include the CUDA module from Numba. Using JIT, I will declare a decorator by specifying the target backend to CUDA. Also for the create fractal function, I will call the decorator CUDA.JIT just before the create underscore fractal function. Also, the pixel size specifications are the same as the previous function. So I'll just copy and paste them here, right? Now, we shall make use of the CUDA.GRID feature. This returns the absolute position of the current thread in the entire grid of blocks. Since we specified two dimensions, this corresponds to the two dimensions declared when instantiating the kernel. Also, we should expect a couple as output of the CUDA.GRID, the X and Y points. After that, the loop logic remains the same as that of create underscore fractal, but now we should use the output of the CUDA.GRID. That is, we will loop over all pixels where for each pixel we call the Mandelbrot function to figure out the color of that pixel. I will copy paste the image initialization and to be even more hard on the GPU, I will double the image sizes per axis. In other words, instead of rendering a 5000 by 7500 image, I will have 10,000 by 15,000 sized image. So think about it, instead of rendering a 4K resolution video, I will render an 8K resolution video. Of course, that would take even more time on a CPU, but the point here is that I will show you that the GPU still outperforms the CPU by orders of magnitude. So now I will compute the number of pixels by just multiplying the length by width of that image. I will specify 32 threads and the number of blocks on the X and Y axis. Furthermore, I will call the create underscore fractal by specifying the number of blocks and threads per dimension 
with the same inputs as that of the CPU. Then I will print the amount of time taken to render the Mandelbrot image and finally we will plot it. Oops, we forgot to define S, so let's define it on top of the create underscore fractal call. Running this, we see only 1.4 seconds of execution as opposed to 110 seconds on a CPU, which is a 78x gain. This simply means that instead of rendering a 4K resolution video over a week on a CPU, you could get the same video in 8K resolution rendered in 2 hours on a GPU if you are using 32 threads. So imagine if you doubled the amount of threads and blocks involved in GPU optimization. Wow! So that's it for the CUDA programming video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. If you did, please leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel so that the YouTube algorithm could show this video to more people. I'll be leaving some cryptocurrency wallets down below so any donation of any amount is highly appreciated. I also have a Patreon account so if you want to support me on Patreon feel free to do so. If you have any questions whatsoever kindly leave them down in the comment section below so that other people could respond to you or I can get to it as soon as possible. I will see you then.